Okay, as, as Zach was sitting there talking, I was realizing that our presentation should have been flipped because I'm going to talk about something that's in the that's going to be in the that is in the spec that will allow those types of provisioning applications to run and not run in not have some of the problems that they have today. So the um, the discussion today that I have here's my agenda for those of you that want to uh, remember it. I hit the wrong button. There we go. It's, I'm going to talk about SysPrep, which is we actually did something in this version of the spec that a lot of the third-party ISVs have been asking for. I, over the last couple of years, I've been getting calls and emails from software vendors that have said things like, we have a piece of software that we want to be in front of the operating system. And we always want to be in front of the operating system. And the answer in the past was, well, you kind of have to go out and you have to look around in the system and try to figure out how to get in front of the operating system. You know, here's a trick that, uh, that will work for Windows 7. Here's a trick that will work for Windows 8, here's a different trick for 8.1, and then each BIOS vendor implemented BDS slightly differently. So you got to pay attention to which BIOS you're in. So uh, Jeff Bobson and I thought we should push something that would be in the spec and solve this problem. So that's the purpose behind SysPrep, is to answer that need. So they, these applications, these drivers, they need to be in the system early before the operating system and they don't need to be kicked out because some operating system decides that they want to boot the, uh, some recovery application or something else. They always want to be there. So these are some examples of things that either people have come and talked to us in the past or uh, we thought up. As, as possible things that you could use this prep for. So you could, the obvious one is encrypted storage unlock. I have a, 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 a more detailed example of encrypted storage unlock later. Another one would be something like user identification or, or verification validation of the customer. So you have a user that that's presented a screen that is they're, they enter a PIN or they enter a password or something like that to get the system open. Well, this needs to be run before the operating system and it allows a, an IT department to write their own special app for doing something like this. Another good example would be like what Zach was talking about where you're doing some sort of system provisioning or some sort of maintenance from a central management uh, server uh, using network boot. Or you want to go out and you want to check all of the firmware that's in the system and you want to make sure that it's up to date. Uh, one that nobody's come to me and, and talked to me about is this uh, some way for someone who has a disability to be able to use the BIOS. And we always assume that there's a keyboard there or there's a or there's a screen that I can tap on. Well, what about someone who doesn't have the, the ability to do those types of fine controls or be able to see the screen? So there, today there's really no solution. This is something that uh, any third party could write a, a, a disability accessibility UI provider. So they could sit on top of the BIOS and they could read the BIOS screens or they could provide larger buttons uh, would be real simple for them. A lot simpler at least. Maybe not real simple because it is in the BIOS. Um, so today people would, would, are going out and they're, they're, they're putting something in the driver list. So the problems with the driver list, the good thing about the driver list, right, it's very early in the, in the boot of the system which means that you have a really, you can do just about anything you want. You don't have to worry about the operating system getting in your way. The problem is, is there's very little support in the, when this 
when you're in this mode, you don't really know what's available in the system. There's no console available. There's no network uh, stack that could be available. And to do a driver uh, start, you have to be attached to a, a physical device. So you plug in a USB device and uh, you can get a driver to load because there's a specific USB device. Or you have some particular card plugged into a slot. You have this, the, the physical device. But if all I'm doing is providing some sort of encryption of a device, of a, of a mass storage, for example, I don't really have a device that I can, that I can call my own. The other thing today uh, a lot of these uh, ISVs are doing is, is getting in the boot list. And so that's, this is really good for them, right? It's always there. You're going to be able to get in the boot list. There's a console already available. So if I want to present a user interface screen, all I have to do is, is pop it up and, and there it is. Um, I can start asking the user questions. The problems with it is uh, uh, there are many problems, right? It's very late in the process, so there's, it's very easy to get kicked out. There are things that could, that could, uh, that could stop. Let me start my timer, so. Um, and it's the issues with the operating system and the, and the different OEMs kicking you out, going some other path this time. So you sit down and you analyze what, the way the Windows, for example, the way Windows goes through the boot list. And you look at that and you go, okay, great, I understand this, I know how to code for it. And then all of a sudden somebody finds a different way of getting into Windows or some way of Windows coming back out and, and wanting to start up setup. And so you lose the path. Or you run across a situation where some of the OEMs they think they know better than uh, they're trying to provide some value add, so they change the way the BDS scans through the boot list and what gets automatically added. We had cases in the early Windows 8 days where some OEMs, they demanded in their spec that, you know, their, that this device was going to be the, at the head of the boot list. So that caused a lot of problem for people uh, that were trying to install applications into the boot list because there was a, the operating system was always first. Okay, so the, the big example, the obvious one is disk encryption. Right? The whole goal here, you have a question. I do, I want to throw a curveball in. There's another current option which is the platform binary table and ACPI. Is that something that has similar disadvantages? Early. Well, you threw me a curveball. You win. <laughs> if I were Jay Arzengrad at P F Pat, I'd throw you a, a T-shirt or something. I don't have anything on that. But I think I think it probably has similar problems. It runs. It seems like it'd run real late. After the operating system, it would run, right? And I also think you have to store the code in. The executable is in the ROM. Yeah. See, the, the beauty of this is it doesn't have to be in the ROM, right? You can be loaded off of the hard drive, or uh, you could even have parts of your code somewhere else. Okay, thanks, Gary. <laughs> thanks for that input. Um, so, we're not really uh, protecting the data as it sits on your desk. We're sitting. Uh, we're protecting the data as it sit, as it sits at rest on your disk. Uh, but you know, this is this example is. You know, I have a hard drive in my system. I want to protect it with some uh, some special security that is that is higher grade than Windows can currently provide. So I want to even be able to protect the Windows bootloader, for example. So I present the user with a, with a logon screen. It's, it allows him to provide his PIN, or the user can, we can scan through and we can uh, use some sort of biometric like her fingerprint or her, uh, the, the, her iris, for example, to receive the unlock permission. 
this goes out, it unlocks or decrypts the, the OS and the data devices on the system. Well, the problem there is what happens if uh, the person comes up and, and doesn't remember the password? Well, you know, after 10 times, you just lock up the system. Well, in, with using this mode, you could actually send a packet out to the, to the help desk. You could say, you know, this particular machine with this special code has a problem. You need to go figure out where that machine is on the network and go stop that bad person from attacking that machine. Or, you know, make an automatic phone call to, or, or help ticket request to get a new password. So these are the types of things that you could do if you were doing a disk encryption. So their current option is to do this load option category boot, which has the problems of, of the operating systems coming in and making changes to you. So they try to integrate into the boot order. These things happen. The OS has changed things. The, the BIOS comes in and changes things and can cause this app to fail. And then the OS disk remains encrypted and you basically have a brick. So how does this app runtime get to run before the operating system in all cases? And today goes at the, that application goes out and reviews the, the boot order list, but it's so variable that it's the programming of that, of that algorithm is probably way too complex. Uh, and there are too many unknowns, things that could change in the future. So what we did was we added something called sysprep. It basically sits between the driver list parsing and the boot list parsing and provides a, a brand new in the middle. Right? Most of the handling is very similar to the boot list uh, and is very similar to the driver list. It does get loaded after the driver and it gets loaded before the boot. So you have this time right there in the middle. It does have to be an EFI image. You have to have the EFI image subsystem EFI application bit set. If you use the attributes, the subfield for the load option category is ignored. So you know, that's a little, these are little things. Uh, that once you get in and you start coding up the application that you'll find that it's a little bit different than driver or a little bit different than boot. But the big thing is you're guaranteed it's sitting right there in the middle. You don't have the issues of driver. You don't have the issues of boot. You have this brand new special category. You have the same console writes as the boot pound targets. So you, if you come up and you decide you need to have access to a console, and you, look, and you look and there's no console loaded already because it's a quick boot into Windows 8, for example, or a quick boot into Windows 10, there won't be a console normally attached. You can go out and you can ask the BIOS to attach a console using the standard platform policy. Same thing with network. You go out, you look, you decide you want to go tell something to the corporate server. You go out, you look, there's no network attached. You can ask the BIOS, hey, give me a standard network using the standard platform policy. And, and it all just works. So you can do those types of things using the boot manager uh, policy protocol, which is something that is published by the UEFI boot manager can be used by any UEFI application, including the ones that are created using Sys, uh, that want to go into the SysPrep list. And the purpose for this protocol is to handle the connection request for whatever required devices that you have, and it typically uses a platform policy. So it would not be a very good technical presentation without uh, you know, some code up on the screen. So here's the requisite code up on the screen with the fly flying through. Um, so this is the this is that protocol. If you want, you can you can provide a, a an exact direct 
connection path to a specific output device, uh, network, or any other device that you want to. Or you can just give it a generic connection request to something like uh, these GUIDs down here, at the, with these GUIDs down here at the bottom, uh, the console policy or the network policy, or you know, you can just do something wild and connect all and have the machine go out and connect, try to connect every device and take the next five minutes looking on networks and everything else uh, and slowing down the boot for the user. Um, but you know, you would use, you're inside this sysprep type of app and you want to go out and connect to a specific device and have it um, and use it to, to show up to go out and talk to remote managed servers or something. Okay? So, what? We're, we're worried about the security all of a sudden here, right? All of a sudden, Dick is, is, uh, is worried about security in, in the systems. Uh, we're getting all sorts of uh, complaints that you can hack these systems. They're very easy to hack. Uh, I remember back in the old days, we had a uh, we could do just about anything we could if, if you if you knew a little bit of assembly language you could put a little code in there and the bias would guarantee it would jump to it you didn't have to do anything short of uh, uh, providing maybe a checksum well so what you have to provide here is it does if the platform has a policy set so that secure boot is required the application must be signed if secure boot is turned off, or you know, let's say you're trying, you're you're doing development, you can obviously turn secure boot off. If you own the machine, you can do your testing. But to deploy it, you should expect the machines to have secure boot turned on. Um, so the application would need to be signed. You can use the UEFI CA if you can find a CA that allows applications to be signed. We could sign this one. Um, you could go to an OEM. If you had a piece of software that you wanted to sell to a specific OEM, you could have them sign it. You could go to ODMs and have them sign it. Or even an, if uh, one of the IBVs provided some sort of signing service, you could go to one of the IBVs and get it signed. Uh, or even a, an end company, for example, uh, uh, many, the CIA, for example, probably has a signing service and they could sign your application for you. Uh, or you could work with the, OED, uh, the OEM or the, or the end user and get your, your cert put in the DB so that whenever we tried to execute your app, we'd look for the, we'd look in the, uh, the DB, we'd find your cert and we would approve it. So we did, we did think about security. And it is fairly hard at this point to hack into a system that has secure boot turned off. That is one uh, area that we have never seen anyone prove that they can they can hack secure boot as much as they want to complain about it. Properly implemented secure, Properly implemented secure boot has never shown to have a, a, a vulnerability. Not to say that CIA couldn't do it, but who knows, or NSA. <clears throat> okay, so the call to action here. If you're an ISV or you're an IHV that wants to write some sort of sysprep app, I definitely come and talk to me. Right? I'm, I'm interested in, in supporting uh, ISVs and IHVs that want to that wanna do a, an application. Let's do the, get the coding in the BIOS and let's uh, start using your code to test it. If you're one of the other BIOS vendors, definitely look at the spec, uh, figure it out. It doesn't seem to me to be a, a really big piece of coding effort. Uh, we should be able to have it done and, and you can work with, you, with these third parties that are already out there and uh, do some testing. And nothing would make me any happier than to be at the next plug fest either in Taiwan or forbid, heaven forbid that the next one's not until next year here. Uh, but let's hope that by that time there is uh, implementation in all three bias vendors and in most of the, uh, the captive bias providers. 
Any questions?